Hello everyone, it's really nice to be here back in Grimaton. It was such a fantastic experience to work with Jenny and Ollie and the team uh, here and I was so glad that they were open to the idea that I would make a work that would be trans um, transmitted from here to all of the nine locations that I'll talk about in a, in a second. Uh, the Distant Sound, which was the project I did last year, last summer, a, a year ago. So, um, yeah, so when I was first asked, um, when Anna and, and Matt and everyone came to my studio uh, to ask if I would be interested in making a work that would connect all three countries, um, basically the entire west coast of Scandinavia, I found that to be a very daunting prospect. I mean, it's huge, it's a huge area. And to make one work that would also connect with the coast, because that was very important. So all these re um, institutions were on the, on the coast, the west coast. So at first I was very hesitant, because like I say, it's a huge, colossal, um, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's the biggest thing I ever considered doing in, in terms of scale. But when I agreed to come on the site with it, I kind of fell in love with the landscape. I mean, it, it's in, it was incredible. I mean, even though it was in the middle of winter and there won't be had a snow, a snow blizzard, <laughs> it was just the most incredible, incredibly beautiful places they brought me to. And, uh, you know, looking, gazing out over the, into the, the water, one thing that I noticed that all of the places had in common were these small islands, these little islets that had broken off from the mainland, and that seemed to be the sort of um, the thing that, yeah, that linked it went the, all of the places in my mind. So, um, and then I started to fantasize that sound might be able to come from there, but you know that's impossible because there's no power on these small tiny islands. I mean, no one lives there. But then one of the partners was Brimaton Radio Station. So, so as I was um, on the journey, this, this um, road trip uh, along the coast, um, it just, I, I couldn't believe it when I realised that, you know, the, the Grimaton were, part, were one of the partners involved in, in the uh, Insight project. So, so I asked them, just, I said, would you, be, would you be willing to be, to be the heart of the project where you'll transmit a sound, a radio installation from here to all the nine locations, and they, they, were, they were very, very open to that idea, and so it was a wonderful start. And then I had, you know, I had an idea, you know, so then I was in, I was like, yeah, I'm really excited about developing something then, and um, so, so the project, um, I don't know, it's called The Distant Sound, and I, I work primarily with sound, I mean, um, so today I've been asked to talk about my, um, well, the distant sound, radio related projects, because I've, I've worked with uh, radio uh, in the past. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I, sp I first became interested in, in the medium of radio when I'd, I'd come across, um, I'd read something Marconi, the pioneer of radio, had once said, which was, when sounds are generated, they never actually die away completely. And that, you know, that every sound we ever make is kind of out there somewhere, generally, you know, reverberating around the universe. And it's just, for me, such an evocative notion, you know, and for thought it was so beautiful, that idea. Um, and so that, so that made me think about radio, working with radio, um, and but I've never actually work, worked with a, an actual radio station like this before, you know, and, you know, this uh, world heritage. Uh, and I just loved the idea that it was like this uh, long wave radio that could transmit underwater. Anyway, that's a whole, maybe another project. But, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so the, the distant sound connects all of the nine locations, um, which I'll just say what they are. Um, first of all, we started off in Bornholm in Denmark, and, uh, and we installed um, three of the uh, the units, 
the Ollies, as we called it, after Ollie, who works here, and he he helped. Um, he kind of basically constructed them, um, and they're, they're receivers and solar panels. And well, you'll see. You'll see. I'm going to show you a short video of, of the work. And then you you start Harbour, Varberg Harbour. Um, uh, Shulom, I can never pronounce it, Shulom, where they did this uh, Melancholia uh, movie. I was, couldn't believe it when, when Anna just casually mentioned, oh yeah, they shot Melancholia here. I was like, oh, no way, so we're in a movie set. It was amazing. Um, the uh, Lysical, um, the back of stone carvings, because that had been surrounded by water at one point. Back, back. Um, and also the Vitlika stone carvings. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, the stone ship in, in Stromstadt, and uh, Isagram in uh, Friedrichstadt, and then in Moss. You know, so it was right up to the very top, then from Bornholm to Moss. Uh, so what um, we did was we transmitted um, through three separate frequencies. Three separate frequencies. These were the frequencies we used from here to the nine different points. And at each point, at the places I just mentioned, there were three of these receivers. And the reason I wanted to use three frequencies as opposed to one is that we can separate all the tones and you use a much larger area. So if you can imagine like one of the the horn speakers with the, the, the receiver and the solar panel was there, and another one was there and another one was there, so you could have this sense of this, the horn sounds calling to one another over a wide space and it really, you know, connected a, a, the space in a way that you wouldn't normally have to make those connections. Uh, so, so in each location there were three of these receivers. And I suppose the theme this were kind of to distance and separation. You know, so when I was looking out into the water and seeing these kind of little islands, that, and, you know, these things kind of come into my mind, you know, of separation and, and distance. And, um, and I'd, I'd, I'd also, I mean, I knew that, well, that the word sound, everyone knows, is a sound that you hear, but it's also a sound, it's a, a, a body of water between two land masses. You know, like the Norse sound. Uh, and, it, and it's derived from the, uh, the word, the Norse word, word sun, is a gap, and also comes from uh, separate, to separate. So I thought that was, so the distant sound also refers to this, this body of water between two land masses. And it, yeah, so I wanted to, um, to make a work that was going to, um, you know, uh, that was touching on, the, on these themes of distance and separation and connected this shared cultural heritage with present moment. So that was that was the my intention with the work. So I recall and um, I discovered that there were these things called radio interval signals. Every radio station used to have its own, you know, and uh, there's there's a whole archive of them and I chose ones that were the, the vintage ones that had a particular quality to them that were more kind of distant and melancholy, the older ones and very simple melodies that would be played between broadcasts. So if you were tuning in, in to say um, Radio um, North Sea, it would have its own particular tune so that you know that you were in the, you, you were in the right um, frequency. So, uh, and then usually it would be played three times and then they say, this is Radio North Sea. So, um, so like I say, I chose ones from the region, uh, from from Scandinavia, and also so sort of ones that were from islands, you know, like far Radio Faroe Islands, or you know the, the relay stations like Radio Madagascar. Um, and in fact, the, the, the radio stations that I chose were Denmark Radio, Radio North Sea, REM Island, KNL, KNLS Anchor Point, Alaska. Radio Greenland, Scans Radio Mercure, NRK, Home Service Norway, and then there was this unidentified one, Radio Far Islands, and Radio Netherlands, and Madagascar, Radio Station. 
And so each, um, each of these uh, radio interval signals were played on horn by a horn player, but all the tones were played individually, so I got them to play each of the tones separately so that they could be broadcast from the three different uh, transmitters out to the three different receivers in each of the nine locations. Uh, and so, yeah, I could really use this huge area, you know, like out in the, in, from, from these little islands. You might hear one from one island and another, and the second tone would be from a, a further away point. Like I say, so it, it had this kind of feeling of the, the, the horn sounds calling to one another. Uh, and then every, every day at the same time on the hour, the, the sound would be activated, but just very fleetingly. It only lasted for like a minute and a half, or a, or a minute max. And uh, But just before the sound came, you know, it was like the, the air was charged with the, with the, the sound of the radio. Yeah, because analog radio, it's really, I think it's really magical. You really, you, you hear it first, you know, the radio, the sound of radio, it's un unmistakable, you know, and uh, and at times, you know, it was different every day, you know, the time, you know, sometimes you had a very clear reception and other times it was, it was, it was, you know, it, depending on the weather, it varies, um, it's variable, you know, depending on different, different circumstances, it was very faint or, you know, <coughs> that unmistakable radio crackle that you get. So anyway, I'll play, I'll play this very short video of it. And, um, oh yeah, well, before I do, I'll just show you something. This is uh, from the uh, Ornholm uh, Museum on the roof. One of the transmitters to get the idea of how it looks. And they looked, they looked really amazing. So that's another one. You can just see, see the solar panel tilted like that.
So, like I say, it was different radio interval signals you heard each hour. So everyone was having this collective experience. No ones who were listening. Or you could be in Borlom, or you could be in Moss, you'd be hearing the same transmission from here. And that one was radio, um, the first one, which was at 10 o'clock, Denmark Radio MP2 from 1977. Um, and then if you have the full length one would have been Radio North Sea, and it's a completely different radio interval signal. But again, very simple. So, I mean, the, I mean we, 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 the exhibition was during the summer months, um, so, and, so you had a captive audience a lot, I suppose, because these, these places are very popular with tourists, some of them. And, uh, but then, of course, you have people who come especially to, to listen to the work, and then you'll have those who just happen upon it unexpectedly. You know, and I, I enjoy that when I work in public space where, where people who might not realise there's anything happening and then all of a sudden you encounter this sound that might draw attention to a place in a, in a, in a new way. So, so I suppose that's where I, I've always come from in my, in my practice. You know, I've, coming from a sculptural background, I, study, I specialise in sculpture and, and visual art. I, became interested in how sound can define architecture and the spatial aspects of sound and how it can also be like a trigger for memory and make you aware of the place you're in while heightening your sense of yourself. You know? So th these things have always been in my, my work from the beginning um, and then moving from having these uh, sculptural installations with sound and then beginning to work with sound uh, in, a, in a more sculptural way where it defines space. So, yeah, so that, that was the distance sound. And we made a very nice uh, publication. And, um, and I have to say, I've given, uh, I've, it's had a wonderful response internationally. I've been, talk, been talking about it in various places uh, since. And it's been very, uh, people are talking about my departure into land art. <laughs> The new thing, uh, but, um, yeah. So, yeah. So, I'm going to move on to talk about um, a, a pro. I don't normally do this, but this is a work that um, I, I've not actually made yet, and it's a work in progress, and it is for it will be for the Istanbul Biennial in September. Uh, and also for the Villa Croce in, Via, in Gen Genova in September. Um, again, Marconi inspired this work because, um, as I say, I'd come across, I'd read about him and um, th this thing that he'd said, hardly said, uh, about sounds being once generated, never actually dying. And, um, and so when I was invited to Genova to do a site visit to, to see the Villa Croce, this beautiful old sort of palace that they use now as a contemporary art space, I, I was, I was um, put up in this hotel where Marconi actually stayed and where his boat, the Electra, was moored. And Marconi had this boat, which you see here as a, as a shipwreck, where he fitted it out with um, radio um, was, uh, as a radio laboratory, and he made his first transmissions from the Electra across water, and famously to Sydney, where he made the first transcontinental uh, transmissions, where he was able to signal to them to turn the town hall lights on in Sydney. So, so the boat was a, you know, very important. Um, but then uh, it was originally built in Scotland for the Archduchess Tre Teresa, Maria, Tere Maria, Maria Teresa. But then the war broke out, and so the Austria wasn't allowed to have it. You know, so um, so then Marconi finally bought it, and he, uh, like I say, it was this floating laboratory. But then when he died, it, bec it became the property of it, uh, it became a warship. And it was torpedoed by the British and and, and uh, shipwrecked in the Dalmatian coast. And so they finally decided to, to move it. And this is this is the Electra, um, 
when you were um, moving it to Trieste, uh, where it was to be cut up into pieces, because that's what you do with boats that you don't need anymore, you have to cut them up, you know. So, uh, so it's funny, when we went to the Genova, the Concordia was there, you know, this, this boat, the Concordia that was, that was sunk in, in Italy, you know. And they were, they were going to do that very same thing with that boat, but to cut up into pieces. So, um, yeah, but like I say, it's a very important boat in Marconi. I mean, so rather than the pieces just disappearing, lots of these institutions wanted to have a piece, you know, like maritime museums or science museums. And so all of, the, all of the pieces are the boat still exist, but they're in all of these different um, locations around Italy. Uh, so what I did was visit all of the parts of the boat. Uh, and the first one you see is in Venice, in the Maritime Museum there, and, um, which is just next to the Arsenale. And it's actually huge, it's much bigger than I imagined it to be. This is the central part of the boat. And I think, as you, as you can see, it's has a very sort of sculptural presence, you know, the presented like sculpture, like this is in the, uh, the garden of, of the Maritime Museum. Um, so I made these very large, these large format photographs of it. And so after Venice, we went to Trieste. Because, as, as I mentioned, the boat was brought to Trieste um, to be cut up, so there are actually five sections of the boat in Trieste. And this, uh, which, which was pretty amazing, the, the prow in the science park um, in Trieste. I thought that, that it looked a bit like a shark's teeth, you know, the front. And this is the map, one of the masts that um, they've installed outside of the, the bus station in Trieste, where Joy, James Joyce famously left Nora Barnacle for hours ago and went to try and find work with suitcases on the first day of their arrival. But that's a whole other story. And that's the, the other last the museum. I mean, some of them are more better preserved than others uh, parts. This is the villa in Santa Margarita. Uh, in Genova, where Marconi had the Electra. His, his daughter actually is still alive, and her name's Electra. And we're going to meet her in Rome. She lives in Rome. It's kind of like a Richard Serra sculpture. But this is my favorite part. I mean, this was the biggest part, the very last part we visited in this multinational kind of um, satellite um, called Telespazio, just outside uh, Rome, where they make, make all the, the transmissions from. And so they have this huge uh, part of uh, the boat there. But it's really rusted. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I also made some recording. Did I? I don't know. I also made some recordings on the way. And it, like I say, it, and this is this work is just really just ideas that are kind of forming as I'm going along, you know. And I had this idea that I would also make recordings underwater um, with a hydrophone. And uh, I've never used a hydrophone before, so it was, it was the, an experiment. Um, and this was on uh, this was in um, Santa Margaret. But um, so anyway, I, I I had my headphones on. I was listening to the sounds and some very interesting sounds. But then 
I heard this distinct sound of a radio transmission, like an uh, Italian radio station. A, a, a man's Italian voice, clearly it was a radio, and then there was some music transmitted. So I took my headphones off, and then I thought, isn't it, I couldn't hear any sound without my headphones. I was really listening, it was someone playing the radio, but I could only pick it up underwater. It was really strange. And in this trip is so recent, I only just got back two days before I had to leave to come to Sweden. So I've not really had time to process everything. But um, so it's a kind of a, maybe someone here can can help me with it because I, I think how why is that? I suppose sound does conduct better through water than it does through air. But um, so the, the hydrophone was acting as a kind of receiver for this for, for radio, which was. Very interesting to me, given given that Marconi's boat, his radio boat, had sunk, and um, and yeah, and how important radio is to connect uh, across distances. So, oh. so it's a very short video, and uh, leave it there. Fishing for sound. I also did another radio project, which I won't talk about today, which was with um, uh, in Nijin, Nijin, in uh, Holland, with this Westerborg um, radio, um, where we I had a radio telescope that was tuned into a pulsar, and we were able to uh, listen to the the pulsar in the gallery live. So that was, um, but I didn't bring a documentation. I just thought we'd mention it as it was another radio project. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say for now.